Okay, I think we should we should just start anyway. Um, we I don't know if there's uh, still other people joining us, but um, I think that I see someone else's on the registered list, so we can always wait for them to join us later and explain a little bit more. So Kelly, shall we start? Go ahead. Okay, great. Um, first of all, I would like to share my screen, screen with you. Um, hi, so a uh, quick introduction to the workshop today. Uh, this workshop is called Restoring Data Dignity in COVID-19. Um, and what we're using is a Taiwanese experience. Um, we usually, uh, we used to call this uh, workshop from data slavery to data autonomy, but we changed the name. So if you are thinking about, um, maybe you are in the wrong room for discussion. No, you're not. Um, we're still the same workshop and we uh, will be di uh, discussing also about the also about uh, data dignity, data slavery, and also the important concept of data um, as labor. Um, and first of all, I would like to introduce a little bit about the facilitators of the workshop. Um, first, it's me, I'm Vivian. From, I'm now working at Bitmark as a community advocate, and I will be introducing the whole, um, like giving you an introduction to the discussion later. And then, uh, Hai Jing, do you want to introduce your, yourself a little bit? Hello, I'm Hai Jing. I'm marketing at Bitmark, so I'm really glad people can join us today. And okay. Yashi. <laughs> Yeah, sure. Yeah, great. Hello. Hi, uh, I'm Yasin. I'm a founder of Radical Exchange Taipei chapter, and I'm also a marketing manager at Dial.io. Great. So I will first invite Yasin to explain a bit about data as labor, because I, um, even though this is one of the like core concepts of radical markets, um, we want to make sure that all of the people are on the same page and know what we're discussing today. So, Yasin, it's your floor. Hello. Hi. 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 So, yeah, thanks, Vivian, for inviting us to join this workshop. It's really a unique, uh, unique opportunity for me. I'm really honored to be here. So, this is the book. It's a Radical Margus, the book, and I've got this... Chinese translation. Um, so, so data as labor is one of the key concepts discussed in the book. Um, the book was published in 2018 and the traditional Chinese translation was published last month in May this year. Um, and the idea is data can be treated as a form of labor. Data provided by humans, so ordinary people like us, can be seen as a form of labor. Um, data work that we're talking about here can take many forms. Data can, work could be posting social media posts, so Twitter or Facebook, Instagram, um, liking the posts and listening to music and recommending restaurants. And when you do these kind of activities, what you're doing is the, the kind of work that the tech companies want you to do, right? Um, because the algorithms that the tech companies are developing can just understand the information themselves. So they need to be fed with data, right? So for example, when you do an internet search with a specific keyword, the activity of choosing which search results to click teaches the search engine how to give you a more customized search results next time for this specific keyword. And so these all sounds very abstract. I want to give you a really great example to illustrate this. So there's this really great creative work that illustrates this concept really well um, is Jennifer's project in 2014. And Jennifer uh, Moran is an American artist. She's the CEO of Radical Exchange Foundation. And she came to Radical Exchange Taipei chapter's first meetup event in July last year. And what she told us was she did this 
the special project, what she did was she registered herself as a company in Delaware as a, a part of a protest project. And so things like her identity, such as her name, appearance and IP addresses and her hair, her bones, all of that are trademarked and they become assets that she can now capitalize on. And what she believed was if people can have ownership and control of their data, they should be the ones compensated for it and not other companies. So the problem is the collection and exploitation of personal data is mostly dominated by big tech companies. So big tech companies like Facebook, like Google, what they're doing is they're making money from your personal data. And they're selling ads to customers with large amount of data that they're collecting. So data suppliers, online users, ordinary people like us are not properly rewarded in that sense. And so we're not properly um, compensated for our digital contribution. And another idea that's also discussed in this book um, is that the book authors mentioned in the chapter, in chapter five, was the idea of forming the so-called data labor unions. And so these unions, which is organizations that will serve as gatekeepers of our data, and that the idea is these data labor unions will negotiate rates on our behalf um, and then monitor the data work, um, the quality of the data work, and even organize strikes if needed. And so I think what makes these workshops really valuable, so the workshop that we are having right now, is we have leaders like Vivian and like Hai Jing and other people were invited um, who are attracting like-minded leaders and we are willing to show up and we are willing to invest in a ton of time and energy to start these kind of dialogues and discussions that are necessary and important to make a difference and that today's workshop is really about giving us a unique opportunity to envision the, the future that we want to live in. And this is why we want to attend Radical Exchange events, um, because we believe in the ca capacity to evolve. We believe in the capacity to grow and the data economy is growing. And how would we, how would our desired future look like? What if we really controlled our data? And what if the tech giants were required to pay for the access of our data. And this is what companies like Bitmark, so the company that Hygiene and Vivian works for, um, is interesting because they recently left Facebook, which is a really brave move for any companies based in Taiwan because Taiwan's over 80% population um, are using Facebook. Um, and so I think Vivian can talk more about that. Yeah, actually, we just quit uh, Facebook and we, we even started this campaign on Facebook of quitting Facebook. So it's pretty funny for us, but um, we're taking it really seriously because we know that we believe that big companies as um, Facebook and as of Google, they're, uh, they're using our data without the consent. It might seem like uh, it might seem insignificant in the beginning, but at the end, it eventually like affects our daily decision and even the so um, like a result of our political election. So it started to affect the structure of the so uh, of the society, and people need to start um, looking into these problems. So we started this uh, campaign and calling out for people to like um, stop giving the this tech giants the access to any of your data and even for the last year uh, we started another project called spring it was a project that we um, built an app and we help people to fetch their own data uh, in facebook so your facebook user data fold will be fetched out to the spring app and you can see how facebook is you is using your data so you can have the first hand control of your own data and you can decide what what kind of the data you want to give to facebook in the future so that was our focus before um we thought that yeah this is what we need to stand out and this is what our focus should be on but until this year covid 19 came by 
And this is when we start, started to see another aspect of the problem of data. Um, we see that so many countries, so many governments, they are using surveillance system, they are using tracing apps, tracing system to track people and to uh, like attend people's um, even at their their locations or even their personal data, uh, personal health data, in the name of public interest and um, containing the virus. That's all true because having the data can help a government make a better decision. But what if the COVID-19 pandemic is ended and after that, the the government still the given uh, the government still don't give your control on your data back. Um, this might be this might not happen uh, or this might like democratic uh, democratic countries might have a like a better system for this but picture that if you are in a detective authority if, if you are under a detective authority what can you do to fight for your data there's almost nowhere out so we started to think how we can um, help contain the virus help track coronavirus by like um, by still um, protecting people's privacy and we're thinking of one really good example it is the example of taiwan where bitmark our company is based so based in taiwan i don't know if any of the participants know taiwan is doing a really good job in containing the virus uh, we only have 447 cases in total and only seven people die and um, as Taiwan is having a really like high population condensity uh, it's a really good job that um, the whole Taiwanese people and the government together are, 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 are doing so what we found out is that Taiwan uh, Taiwanese government has been informed on coronavirus not informed they did a lot of research and they take actions in even last december or early january this year so they take action really early and they make decision precisely depends on the data depends on the information they get and they uh we found out that people really trust uh the taiwanese government when Taiwanese got, when any policy in Taiwan is announced, um, people tend to follow the, the policy, and some of the people even um, like started their launched their own campaign to support the government in order to uh, fight against the virus, fight against the pandemic, and it is what we see a top down and bottom up um, model a really good public private pop partnership experience so we are thinking how can we integrate this into the tool we're developing for fighting against coronavirus this is where we got the uh, idea of autonomy so autonomy is a tool we developed this year it is a public health forecast system so in this system we are taking local institutional and also governmental data and we analyze all of these data and collect the data and generate it into a visualized numerical score so with this score you can get to know which places is uh, more safe and which are having higher risk and you can avoid going to the high uh, to the places with high with higher risk and as i said we merge the local and governmental data, which means we need to get data from the people, but we use the bulwarks of privacy. This is a tech we uh, that Bimark has already has already been doing for years. We have this platform that protect people's digital privacy um, based on the free te technology. The first one is data pooling and the judiciary uh, relationship and also the end-to-end -end encryption with all of this um, technology. 
we can assure that people's privacy are being protected. And yet, as I know, Bitmark cares about people's personal data more than they do. Um, here's a quick video of how this concept is about. Just have a look. So this is autonomy. The concept is having the personal data and the government data integrated into autonomy. And um, as we're integrated, we can get a more uh, precise information, precise a score of a certain place. But meanwhile, we value privacy. We think privacy is really important in the whole process. So that makes autonomy unique. And that makes autonomy a thing that um, almost every country need, a, a tool that almost every country need for the time of pandemic. So with autonomy, you can see that people can have control with your own data. They, their data will be highly protected and won't be abused by any pharmacies, any hospitals, or any big tech companies. But this is still, there is still a gap between having control in your data to data as labor. So we have our data dignity, but we haven't gained a data, we haven't gone to the place that we are using data, data can be a form of your labor. So, this is what we want to discuss with you today. And um, I hope that is clear enough, the, the whole concept. Um, so for today, we'll be using this technique to uh, facilitate our discussion. So how can we use it? This technique is called the five whys. We will be continuously asking ourselves why and eventually finding the root cause of the issue. Okay, so here is a quick um, example. So if today we're having a problem segment called um, the Lincoln Memorial is deteriorating. Uh, and as you know that this Lincoln Memorial is the one at Washington DC and this is a true story. It was really deteriorating a few years ago. And by then, uh, people are spending a lot, um, the staff, they are spending a lot of money repairing the whole memorial just because it's deteriorating. So they started to think, what if, what if we can find another solution for this? So they ask, the first question they ask is, why is the memorial um, deteriorating? And they found out that it's because they are using the harsh chemicals to power wash the whole uh, the, the, the memorial, and that's why it's broken. It's got like uh, broken really really fast. And they dig a little bit deeper. Why are they using the harsh chemicals? And they found out it's because that there are so many bird droppings on the monuments, so they have to use the use the harsh chemical to clean the bird droppings. But why are there so many bird droppings? It's because there are a lot of spiders and birds come here to eat them. But why are there so many spiders? It's because um, there are midges um, on the monuments. So spider come here to uh, like gather to feed. And But why are there so many midges? It's because when the sun is set, uh, during the sunset, um, they turn on the lights to like bring up the whole uh, to to let people can still see the memorial right and the lights attract the minges towards the monuments so they're mashing to the word to the wall that's why there are so many minges and there yeah so there is the root cause so there are so many box box appeal spider and spider got bird, bird got bird droppings, and bird droppings cause out eventually using hot chemicals. So um, if the, they are simply like uh, moving the light, then they don't have to spend a lot of money on repairing the whole memorial. So 
they found their root cause. And today, we're finding our root cause using this technique. So uh, after this page, I will show you a problem statement for us today. What question do we want to ask today? And um, I would like to hear your opinions on it and let's dig into each level of the whys and see why it is happening. Okay, so our problem statement, our first why will be, why don't people care when their health data are abused? We know that we want to eventually achieve data as labor, but before that, we have to at least rare, like raise the awareness of people, um, like raise the awareness that people want to care about it so they can start uh, thinking about this idea. But um, the general thing that we see in Taiwan, I don't know in other countries, the general things we see in Taiwan is that people don't really care about their health data. They just, um, yeah, it's not a really big part of their life. And having it taken away, it doesn't seem like like really affecting their, their daily life. But why is that? Why don't people care? Um, so that is the question we have to discuss on. 